Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we have our popular guest, Ralph Ellis, joining us. Good morning, Ralph. Good morning. Good to be with you again. And today we're going to be discussing the connection between Freemasonry, Egypt, Jesus, and religion. Big topic. So the first question, Ralph, in exploring the origins, do the origins tie back to Egypt? I think so. There's uh, a lot of division on this within uh, Freemasonry because even Masons don't know the origins of their own creed, as it were, or well, it's not supposed to be a creed, of course, uh, their own society. Um, some say yes, some say no. Um, I'm with the group that tends to think there are links back to Egypt because it's it's much older than uh, Grand Lodge Freemasonry would make out. I mean, most Masons will only understand that it comes from opening of Grand Lodge in 1717, uh, which was done on the um, it was done on the summer solstice, if I remember correctly, when it was opened. Um, so, you know, there's the astrological connection straight away. Um, but it's based on much older um, history than that. Within masonry, the actual uh, texts and the rituals go back to the Temple of Solomon. Okay, so we're talking at least 1000 BC there. And it's all based upon the building of Temple of Solomon by Hiram Abif, who was the architect, the chief architect of um, King Solomon and King David. So rather than uh, celebrating the life of a monarch like David or Solomon, Freemasons actually um, venerate the life of Hiram Abif, uh, who was the chief architect. Um, now, I've placed this history back into Egypt. Now, I'm not sure if we talked about this before with the um, United Monarchy of King Solomon. And um, I put the, <clears throat> because we have this problem, we have this problem all the time with the biblical story in that these characters are missing from the historical record. Uh, so I went looking for David and Solomon, and I found them in Tanis in Egypt. Uh, did we go through that this before the history of the United yes, Monarchy? We did. We did. Um, so just a, a 30 second overview. Uh, I equated them with the 21st dynasty of Egypt because they all have the same names, the same court. Everything seems to be the same between the United Monarchy and this uh, monarchy that lived in the Nile Delta circa 950 BC, so exactly the same time. And the chief architect that they had was called uh, Hiram, Ab, um, Hiram Atif. And of course, I equate him with Hiram Abif from, uh, from masonry more than um, uh, the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he's not, he's known as he's known as Hiram Abi, but you wouldn't know that if you read it in the English because it says his name is Hiram is my father. But my father in uh, Hebrew is Abi, so it's Hiram Abi, and in the Egyptian it's Hiram Abif. So <clears throat> within masonry, they seem to have slightly deeper information about this guy uh, than the current Tanakh does, the Old Testament. Uh, and it translates very well back into the Egyptian. So Hiram uh, Abif then in the Egyptian would mean Horus is my father, which is a very standard sort of name for someone in that era, someone who was important. Everyone was the son of a god uh, somewhere. And in this case, he was the son of Horus, a very standard Egyptian name. So masonry goes back to this particular uh, architect 
who was an architect of King David and then King Solomon, uh, but he was uh, murdered uh, by the three Jewies, they call them. Um, and they were three workers who worked for this guy. He was the he was not only the chief architect, he was the chief Freemason. He was a Freemason uh, in the court of King David. And uh, he was murdered and he was buried. <clears throat> and he was in the ground for three days. They sent out search parties and they found him in a shallow grave. And via the lion's grip, he was raised back from the dead again. So this is exactly the same as the raising as, of, of Lazarus. And it's exactly the same as, as the third degree within masonry. That's what you do within the third degree. You become Hirma Bif and you die. You're put in a shallow grave and then you're raised from the dead again on the third day. So this is pushing the history of uh, masonry back to 1000 BC. And back, I say, to Egypt, because I'm convinced that the United Monarchy weren't in Jerusalem at that time. They were actually in Tanis in the Nile Delta, so they were in Egypt. And <clears throat> from their stay in Egypt there, they actually took over the whole of Egypt, because Egypt was divided again, as it often was, between north and south. Uh, and the northern pharaohs uh, in Tanis finally took over the whole of Egypt and had control of Thebes as well, down in the south. Uh, so that is placing masonry back into Egypt. And of course, what they were celebrating was the building of the Temple of uh, Solomon, uh, which is called the Haikal Yahweh, the Temple of uh, Yahweh. But of course, in Egypt, in, with this dynasty in Egypt, uh, their temple was called the Hetkar Ptah. Has the same sort of name, Hetkar, Haikal. He um, uh, but they, theirs was dedicated to Ptah. And Ptah was the, um, the god of architects, not surprisingly. Uh, and and possibly from there, I mean, this is not confirmed, but possibly from there, we get the name Peter. So when we come back into the first century uh, with, you know, the disciples of Jesus, the chief disciple there was called Peter. That may well come from Patar because Peter means the stone and Patar was the god of masonry. So we have a distinct connection there. So all of this is placing Freemasonry back into Egypt. Um, but there are some Freemasons, this is not common, but there are some Freemasons that say that the uh, original building construction that is celebrated from uh, Freemasonry was not the construction of the Temple of Solomon, it was actually the Great Pyramid. So there are some Masons who say that the whole of masonry celebrates the building of, of the Giza pyramids. And that's why this fraternity was so important. They were the pyramid builders and they kept their history running through the millennia. However, hold you, however old you think uh, the Giza pyramids are, because I'm, I'm sort of persuaded by the um, ideas that the Giza pyramids are older than the old dynasty, the old kingdom in Egypt. Um, it may well go back to something like, you know, 10,000 BC or whatever for the construction of the pyramids. Uh, and, and there's various reasons why that might be the case. Um, so, yes, we're looking at a, a fraternity that goes back into Egypt. It goes back a long, long time, has maintained its uh, traditions heavily influenced by the Old Testament, of course, because most of masonry comes from the Old Testament nowadays. It's based on the books of Kings and Chronicles. Uh, but the, the Masonic uh, version of Kings and Chronicles is slightly different. So it's not the same. It's not as if they've just copied um, the Old Testament. It is different. And it's been passed down 
as an oral tradition. So there's no actual written books, it's held within oral traditions, which shows how oral condition, uh, uh, traditions can be maintained. And um, I'm not one of these people that can do this, but when you go into lodge, uh, you will have people who will reel off, you, you may have seen them yourself, um, who will reel off uh, the entire sort of lecture from memory. And it might go on for, you know, 40 minutes or so, complete lecture based on the Old Testament, all done from memory. And it is slightly different from, from the Old Testament. Uh, so yes, it, Freemasonry goes back into Egypt. It goes back a long way. So there are scholars like Ashra Kwesi, who have very much an agreement with you from his research on the ground in Egypt and Kemet. He's showing that even the way that the pharaohs are standing, the pose, the, the, uh, the symbolism of, of how their legs are positioned, how their hands are positioned, it's, it's, you can still see exactly the same position in Freemasonry now. So that's pretty much in agreement with your analysis of the origins as being Egyptian. And, and they do the same within the military as well. It's always by the left quick march. And if you look at all of the pharaohs of Egypt, they all have the left foot forward. Um, and they've all got their arms down holding the two poles of the Ark of the Covenant as well. So if you look at the statues, you'll see their arms down and you might just see the ends of a pole sticking out of their hands. And that's because they're holding the Ark of the Pharaohs, which is the Ark of the Covenant, of course. Um, if you look at the Ark of Tutankhamun, which is in the Cairo Museum, it's identical to the description in the Old Testament. It even has the brass rings on the bottom for holding the carrying poles. So these were very, very common within Egypt, and they were for carrying the shrine of the gods. So the, the Ark of the Covenant was a box which contained the, um, uh, the icon of, of the gods, whichever that was. Now, the icon might have been uh, an icon of, um, you know, Atum or Ra or whatever, but it might also have been a sacred stone just as the Old Testament Ark carried a sacred stone, two, two sacred stones. And these would have been the Omphalos stones that we talked about before, the sacred meteorite, which rather means that the, um, if that's the case, if that's what they were holding in the Ark of the Covenant, that the sacred meteorite was not actually that big, which is why I say it was probably around, I don't know, 60 centimeters high or something. So it wasn't huge, it was a smallish uh, meteorite. And that was a sacred uh, icon of many races down, down the millennia. And I'm pretty sure it was held within one of these Ark of the Covenants. And we can be fairly sure of that because the, the sacred stone when it was at um, Edessa is actually portrayed in a box. So most of the symbols, we, well, most of the images we have of the sacred El Gabal or the Omphalas, whatever it was known about, the Ben Ben it was called as well, uh, Jacob's Pillar or, or Jacob's Pillow, sometimes it's translated as, very, very badly translated as, um, is, is normally a conical stone. That's what it looks like. But when it was in, in Edessa, the coins there show it as a box a box with legs on it and a box that was light enough that it could go on a chariot because it was it was uh, or a cart um, because in Odessa sometimes it's shown on a cart a box on a cart and it's it's a box that looks like the Ark of the Covenant you know with a sort of sloping roof on the top of it um, and when the sacred stone was in uh, Rome it was shown without the box and it was shown again as a conical sort of stone. And again, it was light enough that it could go in a chariot. 
So we're not talking something super heavy here. We're, we're probably talking something that weighs, you know, maximum of 100 kilos or something. Um, and that was probably a, a central part of, of masonry at some point. Uh, remember, the symbols of masonry are all to do with, with rocks and stones. Uh, when you arrive in masonry, you are the, um, uh, the rough ashlar, the rough stone, and then you're hewn by the masons. And, you know, after a few years within masonry, um, you become the smooth ashlar. You've achieved gnosis, you've achieved knowledge, uh, and all the rough edges have been taken off you, and you're now the smooth ashlar. Um, an ashlar meaning a stone. Um, a stone that is worthy of being used, you know, on a cathedral or a church or whatever, you know, something that's been smoothed down and fits nicely on the wall. Um, yeah, so the history of masonry goes back to a very early era. It probably goes back to the Templars as well. And again, that takes us back into the Middle East. So, we, uh, you know, we, we tend to think of masonry as being Western, um, American, British. Well, I suppose there's an awful lot in Germany and France as well. But taking it back into Templar realms, of course, it's Middle Eastern. Um, it was very prominent in, in Egypt when, when the British controlled Egypt. It's been rather neutered nowadays because of the influence of Islam, but uh, originally it was quite strong in, in, in Egypt. Um, and it was, yeah, as I say, it was probably connected to the Templars. Now, the Templars arrived from the uh, Crusades. Um, so the first crusade went out in uh, 1096 to go and liberate um, Christian, because all of the Christian East was all Christian, of course, all of the Near East, all of North Africa, all of uh, modern Anatolia, that was all Christian lands at the time that had been taken over by the Muslims. And so the crusades went out in 1096 to liberate those lands from Muslim control which they did and the first of the crusades didn't go to the near east which is all very peculiar so the first crusade went to antioch uh, which is up on the sort of northeast side of the mediterranean uh, and then it didn't turn right and go down to jerusalem it carried on into mesopotamia so the first city that they liberated from Muslim control in 1098 was Edessa. The very city that I've been talking about that is so closely connected with the gospel story. So the first city they went to was Edessa. And you've got to ask yourself why. Edessa is beyond the Euphrates. It's a long way off towards the east. So why did they go to Edessa? The reason, I think, is because they knew there was secrets to be found in Edessa. So that was, you know, the, the, <coughs> the, the second part of the reasoning for organizing the Crusades. The Crusades were organized to uh, liberate formerly Christian lands. But there were some people in the top of these Crusades who knew that there were secrets, religious secrets, to be found. And that's why they went to Odessa. They went, they went there to find the genealogy and the ancestry of, of the biblical Jesus. That was the whole reason. And I think they probably found that because in 1120, something like that, the Templars were formed. They were formally recognized in uh, uh, 1129, I think. They were formally recognized as a, as a part of Christianity, as a, as a body, as a force. And nobody knows quite why they were created. You know, they were supposed to protect the, you know, the, the, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But it's more likely that they were formed in order to protect secrets. 
That's the whole point of having a secret society is that you can protect secrets. And we know that the Knights Templar concealed secrets, but nobody knows what those secrets are. But we know those secrets made them powerful, very influential. Lots of people joined because they knew that this society had secrets and was, was quite influential. So what were those secrets? We don't know. But I think the secrets were that they had uncovered my, uh, my book, Jesus, King of Edessa. That's what they found. Well, obviously not my book, but the equivalent of in the 12th century, they found that sort of manuscript, a manuscript back in Edessa, which detailed the historical life of the historical Jesus. Another gospel, a secular gospel, which told the secular life of Jesus and who he was and what the gospel story was all about. And of course, if you read my Jesus, King of Edessa, that historical secular story or secular gospel was all about a, a, a real King Jesus, not just a sort of spiritual King Jesus from the Gospels, but a real King Jesus, a Jesus who was a um, King of Edessa. And that's why they went to Edessa first, to pick up that history. And it was obviously quite a powerful history because the Catholic Church was afraid of them. Why were they afraid? Well, because they contained, they held the secrets, the true secrets of the Gospels. And so they were real competitors f f with the, the Catholic Church. I mean, the Catholic Church would be devastated if those secrets got out. Um, and so they ended up as, as enemies, of course, you know at each other's throats because they held different versions of this gospel story. One was the traditional gospel story. The second was this new, well, not new, but secular history of the biblical Jesus. And it was sufficiently different from the gospel story that it could bring the church crashing down. And they knew it which is why they were so afraid of, of uh, Knights Templar. But um, the Templars were also afraid of the Catholic Church for good reason. They were very powerful, very influential. And so they could not tell this story <clears throat> openly without being burnt at the, at the stake, literally burnt alive at the stake by the Catholic Church as the Catholic Church has done on many, many occasions in its history. And so they were, they, they were worried by this and they were stuck by this. How do you disseminate this information if it's so heretical that you could be burnt at the stake for actually giving this information to others? Um, and so what they did is they created King Arthur and the Arthurian story. And this comes into my book, um, The Grail Cipher, because as I was going through Arthurian legend, I kept seeing an awful lot of biblical history within it. And this was interesting, but puzzling. I didn't know what to make of it initially until I did a big research program into it. But... Um, we didn't, did we talk about King Arthur? I don't think we did, did we previously? No, no we no, haven't. Okay. We haven't, but it was, it was something that we were going to do at some point. Well, it's probably uh, as well to go through it here because it's a big part of Masonic history, in my view. And this has never been uncovered before. This is the first time this has been uncovered and spoken about within the last five, 600 years. <clears throat> so this is sort of new information. Um, King Arthur does not exist. He's not there. He's like all of these other problems. You know, when, every time we start looking for someone in the historical record, he's not there. 
and and people have this view of king arthur because they've seen the films <clears throat> they've probably read the history they know who this guy is they know he's a dark age king of britain etc 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 except he doesn't exist he's not there so you know the first of the uh, chronicles from this era which comes from the dark age era is gildas and he doesn't mention king arthur whatsoever and then we have the venerable Bede and Nennius who don't Bede doesn't mention King Arthur whatsoever Nennius mentions a uh, Dux Ballorum a, 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 a warlord who might have been called Arthur but that there is no commonality with the Arthurian story there's just a mention of a guy there was a guy called Arthur um, and then we have Henry of Huntingdon um and he doesn't mention king arthur whatsoever so henry huntingdon we're coming up to the 12th century and he's still not mentioning king arthur so all the way through from say 500 uh, a.d all the way through to the early 1100s there is no mention of the king arthur story and then suddenly in 1135 just after the foundation of the Knights Templar, <clears throat> we get the full Arthurian story. And it just appears just like that. And it's a full-fledged story. There's no history prior to this. And suddenly we've got this full, complete story of this King Arthur and his court and Guinevere and everything else suddenly arrives. And you think, where, where on earth did that come from? And then you get... Um, uh later on you you get people like william of newborough who who writes i mean all of these are, are fairly good histories of the english people or the british people um william of newborough who comes after um geoffrey of monmouth he writes a very very good chronicle of uh what was it called history of the english affairs and he tears monmouth apart saying he's writing complete rubbish. This King Arthur guy never existed. Monmouth is a fool, etc. You could not have a king that was as famous as Alexander the Great and have no one ever write about this king. And he's right to say so. How would you conceal Alexander the Great, you know, for five, six hundred years? And so Newber is right, you know, Arthur does not exist. And therefore what Monmouth and Oxford were writing about was a complete fabrication. But it wasn't a complete fabrication. What they were doing is they were narrating a story that was heretical. You could not tell the story openly, so he made a partly fantasy story of it. The story was the story of King Jesus in Judea. And all he's done is change the name from Jesus to Arthur, relocated this story into uh, Great Britain, and now you can tell the story to anyone with no fear whatsoever of being burnt at the stake. Because it's just a well, it's supposed to be a history, but everyone knows it's a bit of a fantasy because this guy never existed before 1135. And you can disseminate this information and talk about it, and everybody is happy. In fact, you can sit there laughing at the Catholic Church while you're reading it because you're secure in the knowledge that nobody knows what on earth you're talking about. And then we come on to some of the manuscripts because people will say, no, it's rubbish. You know, this, this all occurred in Britain. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> Unfortunately, most people who comment on the Arthurian story have never researched and read Arthurian legend. Because it's deep, it's dark, it's impenetrable. Um, there was a guy that wrote a history of Arthur just before mine came out. Uh, I forget what his name is now. And he wrote a history of King Arthur based on Monmouth. I don't think he'd even read Oxford. 
and he had never read the Vulgate cycle. Now, the Vulgate cycle is nine volumes, I think, probably about five and a half thousand pages of Arthurian legend. And you've got to work your way through that. I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's heavy going. Um, but you're not going to know the Arthurian story until you read all of this. Because Arthurian history is not as you expect. And suddenly you start coming across all sorts of oddities, like, well, of course, one of the main characters within Arthurian legend is Joseph of Arimathea. Now, that's a bit of a problem. A, he's in Judea. B, he's first century. What's he got to do with the story? Um, and then you find that uh, Percival, uh, Sir Percival was one of the Arthurian knights. Um, I say he became Galahad because Galahad is a title. Uh, it goes back to the sacred eunuchs that we were talking about before. Uh, and so he became the Galahad later on. So his name was uh, Percival the Galahad. Um, but he was the nephew of Joseph of Arimathea. Now that's a problem. Uh, again, we're talking first century here. The first of the Fisher Kings, who's related to King Arthur, um, he owned the donkey that had been owned by uh, Joseph of Arimathea. That's another problem. We're talking about a 500 year old donkey here, um, is the only other way of explaining it. Um, what else happens? Oh, yes, one of the big heresy of Arthurian legend, if you read these other manuscripts, is that the original author of Arthurian legend was Josephus Flavius. And this is what it says in the text. It says that um, the author of this uh, text was um, Josephus the good scribe, who was a witness to scripture. Now, what Josephus was a good scribe who was a witness to scripture is Josephus Flavius. And of course, other people have recognized this and they've looked at it and they've read it. People like Nietzsche, who's one of the um, fathers of Arthurian research back in the 19th century. And they say things like, uh, well, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's indicating here that Josephus Flavius uh, wrote this text. But of course, that's an error. And they just move on. But of course, it's not an error. This is part of Arthurian history. Uh, and you read things like Parsifal, which is the German one, because there's a funny thing that happened on the way to Arthurian legend. Um, the only country that never wrote about King Arthur was Great Britain. And people will say, no, 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 you're wrong. You're, you're wrong. Um, um, what about Thomas Mallory? Well, Thomas Mallory uh, didn't write until very late. He was, I don't know, 14th, 15th century. I can't remember what he was now. Uh, and he only wrote his Arthurian history because he couldn't find a British text. And what he says in his, his foreword, he says, for in all places, Christian and heathen, Arthur is reputed. He is more spoken of beyond the sea, more books made of his noble acts than there be in England. And they're printed in, uh, in Dutch, Italian, Spanish, Greek, and French, but not in English. So he wrote an English one because he couldn't find a British text because uh, you know, people look at um, uh, Monmouth and Oxford, but of course Monmouth was, was Norman French. He wasn't, he wasn't English at all. He wasn't Welsh where the, you know, lots of people say this text comes from. Um, so he, he was Norman French and we find Arthurian histories all over the place. So we have a Scottish version, which is uh, Roman and Fergus. We have Italian ones, Florent and Florette. Uh, we have the Norman ver versions, Percival, um, uh, Cretien Tours, of course. 
uh, German versions, Parsifal, Greek versions. L he's all over the place, except for Britain. I mean, here's a, um, here's a conundrum for Arthurian purists who, who loved King Arthur. Where is the earliest uh, two statues, uh, well, statues, carvings of King Arthur? So where would we find the earliest carvings of King Arthur? Tricky one, that one. And these are very early carvings. These are 12th century, so they're from this era. You know, we're talking the 1150s or so AD. And they are both in Italy. One is on Modena Cathedral in northern Italy, and the other one's on Barry Cathedral, uh, which is in southern Italy. And there's another one. Uh, there's a mosaic of Arthur in Otranti, which is gained down in, in southern Italy. And you might be saying, well, what, why on earth is King Arthur down in Italy? Well, because this was a crusader story. This was a Norman French story. Um, remember, the Normans were Scandinavians. They're not French at all. The Vikings. And the Vikings took over northern France and became the Normans. And then the Normans took over England and became the Norman French in England. And most of these crusaders were actually Norman, Norman French, Norman English, and Norman Italian, because the Normans had been down to Italy. And they had liberated Italy from Muslim control because it, Italy was Muslim at the time. But the Normans went down there and King Roger I of Italy, who was a Norman, took over southern Italy. And of course, he was a crusader. And so where would these histories come back from after the uh, crusaders? Uh, started returning from, from the Near East, they would go back to France and to Southern Italy. And that's why you see these connections with Arthurian legend being so strong in Italy and Northern France, and not necessarily so much in Great Britain. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the sort of Templar heresy that no one will talk about, um, that this is actually a story relating the history of, of King Jesus. And of course, tying this all back into Freemasonry, Jesus was a Freemason. We talked about this before uh, with the raising of Lazarus being a third degree raising, with Jesus being called the tecton which means architect, not a carpenter. It doesn't mean carpenter at all. It means architect. But in this case, it's not an, an, an operative architect. It's a speculative architect. Masons today are called architects, the same as Jesus. And so Jesus was the master, probably the grand master, of the Judean and Syrian lodge. And so <clears throat> when the Crusaders went to Edessa, one of the things they would have found was not only the history of Jesus, but the history of masonry as well. And so they brought that history back with them. I mean, the, 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 the Knights Templar, the community rule of the Knights Templar is the same as the community rule of the Essenes on the Dead Sea, it's almost exactly the same. So quite clearly, the Knights Templar were not inventing something de novo in the 11th, 12th centuries. They were copying what they discovered when they went down to Judea. And so the Knights Templar 
are exactly the same as the Church of Jesus and James. Remember, the Church of Jesus and James were Nazarene, Egypto-Jews, with a lot of Egyptian influence, and they were known as the poor. They were the Ebionites, which means the poor. And of course, the Knights Templar are the poor Knights of Christ. And they followed the same rules and regulations as the original Church of Jesus and James. I mean, um, the, the Church of Jesus and James was communist. Pseudo-communist. No, probably communist. Remember, they all lived out of the common purse, which was held by Judas. It was a communist institution where you had to give your money to the church of you had to give all of your money not just money all of your money all of your belongings you had to give to the church of jesus and james and we know this because of course we have that incident uh where ananias and sophia held back some of their money so they wanted to join the church and they held back some property. They didn't give it all to the church. And so St. Peter murdered them both. And again, that's not preached from the pulpit, but if you look up the, uh, um, the life of Ananias and Sophia in Acts of the Apostles, you will see that they had to give up all of their uh, wealth to the church. And the penalties for not doing so were severe. And so they were both killed. Um, I don't have a, a reference for that. I will get you a reference while we're talking about this. Um, so Let's have a quick look. Uh, Acts 5. So if you start in Acts 5.1, and it goes all the way down to Acts 5.20 or something. Um, a man called Ananias and his wife Sephira, who sold a possession in order to join the church. Um, interesting story, that. Not preached from the pulpit, because, of course, it doesn't go along with um, the Christian ideals. But the Knights... Templar did exactly the same thing. So if you joined the Knights Templar, you had to give all of your wealth to the Knights Templar, to the church, and then you could become a member. And you lived in a sort of communist society where you didn't have any belongings yourself. Everything was owned by the um, organization. Um, and Judaism has the same thing, of course. I mean, that's the whole point of, of the, um, uh, the... I'm forgetting the name of the uh, farming communities in Judea. Uh, I'll remember it in a minute. But anyway, if, if you've been to Judea, you know they'll have the um, kibbutzis. That's what I was looking for. The kibbutz system is exactly the same. So if you join a kibbutz, you have to give all your wealth to the kibbutz and you live in a fully communist society, not a pretend one as they had in Russia, um, but a, a fully communist society where you don't have any money at all. And you don't even have things like clothes because even your clothes are commun communal. And you eat communally in the, you know, the big canteen. There's no private cooking. You don't even have cooking facilities. Um, when I was there, we had just a kettle is all we had. And everything, so breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything is uh, eaten communally in the, um, in the big canteen restaurant. And so you're looked after by the society. That's exactly how the Church of Jesus and James ran their society and they were called the poor because of this because they had no money but that doesn't mean that the institution was poor they were stupendously rich because obviously they, they had land grants from all of these people joining their society and they were stupendously rich same as the knights templar 
was stupendously rich. So if you were at the top of the Knights Templar, you controlled an awful lot of wealth and an awful lot of power because you held all of this money. Same with the Church of Jesus and James, because in my books, I've said that they are linked to the uh, uh, Bothians. And the Bothusians were a similar sect, part of the Church of Jesus and James, um, who were again known as the poor, but they only used solid gold crockery and cutlery. Shows how wealthy they were as an organization. And so they will, wielded a lot of power and influence within the region, same as the Knight Templar did. And that's why the Knights Templar were, were destroyed. Because they held these secrets, which the Catholic Church didn't like. They were extremely wealthy, more wealthy than the uh, church was. They ran the whole of the banking system. So this is back in the, you know, the 13th uh, century. They were running the entire banking system of Europe. And they had international banking with money transfers across Europe. So if you were going to the um, Near East, you could put your money on deposit in London. And you could take it out in Jerusalem when you got to Jerusalem. A complete international banking system, which is why some people think that the Knights Templar ended up in Switzerland, um, because Switzerland is the center of, uh, you know, European banking. And they have the symbol of Switzerland is, of course, the Templar cross. Um, th there is possibly a link there. Um, but the church obviously coveted all of this money and wealth and power that the Templars had. And so they were all destroyed. Secret orders went out and they were all destroyed on Friday the 13th, 1307. And that's why Friday the 13th is unlucky for some because it's the date when the Knights Templar were destroyed. And so, you know, these aspects of this history are still within common knowledge and common history and common culture. Um, yeah, so that's the history of the Templars. Any, anything to add on that? It's so it's going back to like the stories of Lazarus and the symbolism in the Bible, would be right to say that the authors were exposed to or were Freemasons? The author of the Gospels, I say, is linked to Josephus Flavius, to Saul. And he didn't understand Freemasonry because he had never been initiated, apart from maybe into, you know, the first degree or something, because they didn't trust him. So Saul, Josephus, was taken up um, into the third heaven, I think, in, in one of the epistles. He's taken up into the third heaven, which I estimate is, is probably something to do with the Giza Plateau. But if that's true, then he was up in the uh, third heaven, the third initiation, but there would have been seven initiations. Um, there were seven steps on the um, stairway to heaven. Um, so he was never fully initiated. So he didn't understand all of this. And that's why we get very little um, astrology uh, or Freemasonry within the gospel story because he didn't understand it. And if anything, he was trying to denigrate it. And so largely, most of that was deleted from the gospel story. Some of it is there, but you have to look very hard for it. Um, you know, go and see the water carrier, you know, who's in the house, the house of the water carrier. Now, who's the house of the water carrier? You know, that's Aquarius. Um, so there are some odd mentions, but it's quite apparent that whoever was writing the Gospels did not, had not been initiated. Because remember, we, we talked about this before, there were two distinct churches. 
There was the Church of Jesus and James, uh, which was a Nazarene Egypto uh, Judaic church, fairly strict, initiatory. Um, you had to be initiated, you had to be selected. And then there was the Church of Saul Josephus, the simple Judaism, as I say it, which was the Church of the Gentiles. He became the apostle to the Gentiles. And so that was a completely open church. Anyone could join as long as you put some money in the collecting plate. He didn't care. And it was simple Judaic in his, it did away with all of Mosaic law and everything uh, to do with that. And it was pro-Roman. And so we had these two very distinct churches uh, which became enemies of each other. But of course, it was the Gentile church of, of Saul Josephus that, prevailed and that became christianity whereas the uh, church of jesus and james sank into obscurity and probably became connected with what became uh, freemasonry later on um, so as i said before anyone who is a christian is supporting the church of the enemy of jesus so they're not christians Do the recorded ages of Jesus at 12, 30, and 33 relate to Freemasonry? Freemasonry and Judaism. Um, so, yeah, we have this story. In fact, we have two stories, almost exactly the same. We have Jesus teaching the elders, you know, um, at the age of 12 or 13 or whatever it was. And we have Josephus Flavius do, does exactly the same. It's almost identical. So if anyone regards um, that as a miracle by Jesus, that he was teaching the eld elders at the age of 12, well, Josephus Flavius did exactly the same. And of course, it's, it's nothing to do with a miracle. It's, it's, it's like everything in, in the Gospels. It's been misinterpreted deliberately because it's quite obvious that it was a bar mitzvah when you become a man age 13 nowadays it's 14 within judaism uh you have a bar mitzvah and you have to give a bible reading to the elders and the elders will ask you questions to see if you can understand your old testament otherwise you cannot pass your bar mitzvah I don't think many people are rejected, but I mean, that's the whole idea. Uh, in order to become a man, you must understand um, the whole of the Tanakh. And that's why you're giving lectures to the elders. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. That's exactly what Josephus was doing. It's nothing miraculous at all. It's just a bar mitzvah. And that's why Josephus can be Saul, because... Uh, he would have passed his bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah in um, age 14. He would have been AD 51. And he went on his first expedition across the Mediterranean uh, in AD 52. So, yes, Josephus can be Saul because he would have been 15 years old on his first expedition across the Mediterranean, evangelizing to the Jews across the Mediterranean. The chronology fits. No problem at all. Uh, 33, yes, it's probably uh, to do with masonry, uh, although I don't think he was crucified in 33, of course. Um, that date might be to do with the, uh, the death of, um, uh, of John the Baptist. So we have two spiritual leaders. We have John and we have Jesus. And I think if we're talking about a very famous death in the AD 30s, early AD 30s, that was the death of John the Baptist, who got messed up in the problem of Aretas of Petra and his daughter being rejected by um, one of the tetrarchs in, in Judea. I think we went through that before, didn't we? Yes. Um, and so, yeah, that would have been a very famous death in that era of a very famous pre preacher, because I say that John would have been related, of course, to Jesus. 
<clears throat> well, it says that even in the Gospels, it says that. Um, so he would have been related in some fashion to the Edessan monarchy. I haven't worked out who he is yet in the Edessan monarchy. I've, I've not actually discovered him. But he would have been a prince of Edessa. And of course, that would have created a bit of a ruckus, you know? If one of the Judean tetrarchs had, um, had um, I was going to say crucified, had beheaded John the Baptist as a prince of Edessa, then of course the Edessan army would have been down there in Judea punishing the tetrarchs, which is exactly what Josephus Flavius says. Except Josephus Flavius covers it up and he says that the people from Syria were fugitives from Syria who came and defeated the um, Judean tetrarch. Um, it wasn't uh, Archelaus, it was Antipas, it was Herod Antipas. But of course, <laughs> typical Josephus, he's covering up who these people are, fugitives from Syria. It's nothing to do with fugitives. And if you read the um, equivalent account by Moses of Corinne, who was a Syriac um, historian, he says that these fugitives was the army of Edessa, who came down and punished Herod Antipas and defeated his army. Um, so yeah, that was that little episode, which reverberated down um, the decades after that. Um, so yes, of course, Ed Edessa wouldn't have been very happy with the Judean monarchs or tetrarchs for doing that. If I'm doing some reading, I've even seen that uh, some are trying to correlate these ages of Jesus, 12, 13, 33, to astrotheology. Well, he was connected with astrotheology, but um, the, the cosmos doesn't move that fast. Um, so he was the first of the fisher kings. That's why he became a fisher of men. Um, so he was celebrated. One of the reasons that Jesus and John before him were celebrated was because they were the first of the kings of Pisces. So um, the age of Aries ran from 1750 BC to 10 AD. And then in 10 AD, the constellations changed in procession and Pisces came to the fore. And that's why Jesus was born as a lamb of God, but became a fisher of men because he was one of the first of the fisher kings. And of course, if you look in Arthurian legend, of course, it's all about this line of fisher kings. And Jesus was the first of the fisher kings. And we even get that within the, um, the father of King Arthur, um, which again shows the heritage of where this story came from. You know, everyone will know this story and they'll say that the father of King Arthur was called Pendragon, Uther Pendragon. And of course, the birth of Arthur, the conception and the birth of Arthur, which is a very convoluted story, is actually the birth of Hercules, is exactly the same. So they've adopted this ancient history of Hercules and they've given the same birth to King Arthur. But the father of Arthur is Uther Pendragon. And everybody knows that because we've all been told that. Um, but when I read the original text, so I got um, three of the original texts in Latin, uh, one by the Welsh and two by the English. And he's not called Uther Pendragon at all. He's called Uther Ben Dragon. Ben Dragon. It's Aramaic. It's not Welsh. It's not Latin. It's Aramaic. And Ben Dragon in uh, Aramaic means the son of the fish. Okay, now who's the son of the fish? We're not talking about Arthur here. We're talking about the first of the fisher kings, which would have been King Jesus. And that's why Arthur was called Ben Dragon, the son of the fish. 
Uh, so you can see how all of this links back up to um, first century Judea again. 